A symbolic annual event with powerful images. Earth Hour has been a moment for millions of people to come together and think about our impact on the world around us. This year's event takes on new meaning. Well, we may be going into lockdown, but we are certainly not alone. Uh, we've got a map for you that just shows how many countries are in lockdown. You'll, it'll pop up on the screen shortly. The red indicates countries in lockdown or who are about to go into lockdown or who have declared a state of emergency. Police are on the streets across Europe. In Spain, France, Italy and Greece, their job is to make sure anyone who's outside their home has a valid reason. If they don't, they risk a fine. What can I say? It's difficult for everyone, but we have to get used to it, for the good of everyone. Something environmentalists say is benefiting planet Earth, as cities and economies come to a halt. While many of our landmarks, office buildings and apartment blocks go dark for 60 minutes, 7.6 billion people are being forced by events or Mother Nature to realize what else just isn't working. Organizers say now, more than ever, is the time to unite to safeguard our future and the future of our planet. Well, just like the regular people of the world, celebrities are coping with being cooped up due to virus. Some are coping more creatively than others. Is it any wonder that Wonder Woman herself, Gal Gadot, has gotten a bunch of celebrities together to sing? Imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. No hell below us. Above us on this sky From Jimmy Fallon to Sia Imagine all the people From Will Ferrell oh, Greed and hunger To Mark Ruffalo Good of man Imagine all the people living for today. You hear it Imagine there is no country It isn't hard to do. Nothing to kill or die for. And no religion too. Someday you'll join us And the world will be as one Gal Gadot says she was inspired by the trumpeter who played Imagine <laughs> From a balcony in Italy to comfort others stuck at home Though some criticized Gadot's version, Imagine No, Imagine no possession, possession, sung by some of the wealthiest people in the world. But how about singing Have Yourself a Merry Little Quarantine? We'll just have to model through. Outside Nashville, Brenda Sparks has turned her Christmas lights back on. And so we just wanted to bring a little light into these dark days. The virus has altered some of the Catholic Church's ancient rituals, such as holding Lent and Easter services this year in empty churches. Other world religions are adopting similar measures to limit the coronavirus risk. At one of India's holiest shrines for the Sikh religion, there is more health-related activity than religious prayer going on, and fewer visitors to the Golden Temple of Amritsar. 
Buddhist temples across South Asia are also seeing a sharp decrease in the number of prayer goers. So has Islamist holiest mosque in Mecca, where the year-round smaller pilgrimage of Umrah has been suspended for the first time in more than 40 years. But the most drastic measure was the total closure of all mosques, not only in Saudi Arabia, but the Gulf region and most of the Muslim world. It's important to indicate the figure that uh, it's about 2.6 billion worldwide. Yes. These are people that we understand are going to be confined to lockdowns as countries try to fight. In Germany, the streets are quiet following the introduction of a new rule banning public gatherings of more than two people. So we now know the beaches are closed, but if you're looking to go for a stroll or walk your dog along the Pacific Ocean, that is no longer allowed. Tonight, McHugh Kroll squeezed in a run along the beach in Santa Monica. So I thought I'm going to get another run in while I still can. And one thing that uh, I, I read a while ago, and it's just been mulling over in my mind, just this idea as we go through this, this time of the COVID pandemic, and I was just talking about how as our constraints are, as our borders are, as the area around us gets smaller and smaller and smaller, you know, in that sense of like, you know, sports, you know, a whole generation of husbands is not going to know what to do because, you know, <laughs> everything in sports out league has been taken away. But all these different things, you know, restaurants are closing and things like that. They're limiting the groups of people that can be together. But as those, the boundary becomes smaller and smaller, that's what produces fear. That's what produces, you know, panic in people. But they really pointed this out that it's also the opportunity for something brand new to be birthed in that moment. Yeah. And I think that we found that, I mean, even, even this, there's no reason why we couldn't have done something like this before. Right. But it never even really became an idea or a thought until we couldn't do what we were so used to doing every single Sunday. Just, but I think just that idea of, of end times, I guess, kind of in closing is everyone, you know, has an opinion of what this all means and what it's not. But I think the one thing that we can all agree on is it's, it's a wake up call, you know, to what is, what's really important. You know, the things that we think we valued is so important are taken away from us. It changes us. We're all forced to do different things. And I think that, uh, you know, the thing is how we respond today really is shapes, you yeah. know, who we're going to become or, or what we're going to do tomorrow and, and so on. And so for a while it's modern history, the question has been debated over whether to resort to God or rely on science in the form of medicine and hygiene at times of great calamities. In the case of the existential threat of coronavirus, there seems to be a growing consensus that prayer and science should be combined for maximum effect. This is one of those topics that as you look online, I mean, you can find all sorts of stuff. Mm -hmm. You can find some people, as you've mentioned, a lot of even pastors just don't even care about this subject. And you can find people who just, I mean, they've got everything dialed in and they've written books and it sounds more like a, a sci-fi movie than something that could actually happen. But I got to thinking, you know, some people, I think not just pastors, but some people just don't really dig into this stuff just because it's like, I can't get, I can't understand that. Everything, you spend a whole week, you spent years and years and years studying this. But I just want to kind of put it out there for people who are watching. Uh, if people want to try to get a grasp on this, something that's not going to go too far deep in to say like, this means this and this means this, because obviously a lot of this is pure speculation. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot is, um, you, you've detailed out some very specific things, but a lot of it is just, we just don't know. Yeah. And so are there any, any resources or ways that you would encourage people to, to kind of dip your toe in that water and start to like, it's important that we, that we figure out, I mean, this is going to happen. And so we would be wise to, to be aware of it. Well, I, I would strongly suggest that they listen to all of my tapes on this subject. <laughs> um, I'm afraid that uh, I, right off the top of my head, I can't recommend any one particular author or book uh, simply because I don't ever read those anymore. Mm. And, and for the very reason you stated, that you get a lot of uh, different ideas and, and a lot of speculations. And we shouldn't assume that speculation is wrong, mm. but I think that you know when we look at something and somebody states, well, it could possibly this and be possibly that, well, 
in terms of something being logic possible, yeah, there's all sorts of possibilities. But what is logically possible? And that's where when you study this topic, you try to, at least what I try to do is try to find out what are the, the parameters in which the scriptures define this event and how do I make all those various parts fit together? And it is a very difficult thing. And I don't uh, put my views out there as if they are the final word um, because I'm like everybody else. I'm growing and my understanding changes. And I think one of the problems we've had historically with people trying to understand end times prophecy is they look at the world around them at that moment in time and then try to interpret it within that context. And I I admit that what I do is I look at what's going on in the world around me and see how does it line up with what the Bible says. And I put them out there as things, possibilities that I encourage people to consider and reflect upon. But... uh, There was one other time I was wrong, and so this could be the (laughs) second time, right? Well, I think that's the other thing about just this time, I guess, in history, is that you use that word possibility. And from what I've seen, just when when I'm looking online or in different books and things, is is possibility doesn't mean the same thing as as you say. You're Mm -hmm. saying, oh, just here's something to think about. But what I've found is that when people say that something's possible, it's so much more than that. They hold that view deep in their heart and it actually is affecting how they live. And so yeah. they're making their decisions. They're saying what they're saying or not saying what they're saying based on that. It's not just a possibility for them. Yeah. Well, that's why I think that theology is never something that should be studied in isolation. And that's where I find that some of the most, uh, what I would call bizarre concepts come from people who really don't talk to anybody else but themselves. They, right. Or if they have a group, they're, they're a group of people that are fairly sycophantic and supporting of whatever they come up with. And I think that uh, in one sense, none of us like the idea of being challenged in what we're saying. But there is, as, as Proverbs says, as iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. And uh, I read those views, many of them that are put out there, and I've read different books on it. And, got, and, and try to take in and see how it works. At the end of the day, there is no perfect explanation because the perfect hasn't yet come. But more importantly to me is the fact that we are watching. We are watching. We're looking at the world around us. We're looking at the word of God and we're trying to say, Lord, what are gonna be those signs of his coming? And you know, again, I've stated my opinion, my personal point of view, that I, I can't, I don't believe there's been another time in human history where we have had more evidence to point us to, or at least more signs pointing us to the end times than what we have in the world today. The whole point is that uh, these aren't things that we go to battle over each other. These aren't central issues. What is, I think, central is that we believe that Christ is going to return and that we must believe on him in order to be saved. Uh, The other issues, you you can hold your opinions. We can disagree. Um, I can just say that from where I'm sitting, I'm really trying my best to give the most accurate uh, representation of what I think the scriptures foretell. Yeah, Yeah, something you just said, actually, I just read something this morning. It was just talking about how this idea of pragmatism has not not only come in and infiltrated, but is starting to take control of the church. And that idea of you saying like, well, it's a job, you know, you can very easily turn things into what it works Mm -hmm. and, and lose sight of like, that's totally not what the Bible says. That's totally not what it, so it's not about just because it works doesn't give us a justification yeah. uh, for doing it. But I think the other thing is, you know, when you talk about end times, really, I think depending, I guess this is probably more relatable to people who either grew up in the church or maybe they've been following Christ or studying the Bible or been in church for many, many years. And they get so focused on the end times and focusing if now we are, um, if we're there or not, or how close are we, or basically kind of, as you talked about, we're just gonna hold on because we know it's gonna happen in our lifetime, which I'm not sure how we know it's gonna happen in our lifetime. I didn't figure that out, <laughs> but but it's all, we, we lose sight or the focus of, of the part in Revelation that says, occupy till I come. Mm-hmm. And, and so easy for us to just become kind of irrelevant in yeah. what we're doing here because we're just holding on. But it's just looking different. Yeah. yeah, it's really interesting how things like we viewed virtual communication and, and presence as being a bad thing, and yet it is proving to be a very 
powerful way for Christians to connect in a very real way. I mean, my wife and I spend more time FaceTiming our family and friends than we ever did before. And it's, it's kind of like, it's interesting because we're talking about more significant things as well. And we're able to minister to one another in ways that we never had the necessity to. And I, I think that's really uh, interesting because God doesn't ever let anything happen except for a greater purpose. For decades, we have been talking about what would we do if the day comes where the government forbid us to worship? What, what would be our response? And it's interesting, now it's happened. <laughs> yeah, I think the interesting thing is, I think, I mean, except churches all over are, are learning new ways to do things. And I, I think the interesting thing is, is what's going to happen after we're not forced to? You yeah. know, are we going to, are these going to be new things that we have, have been challenged to think in a different way? Or are we going to just be tempted to go back to the way things were and get back into our own yeah. Um, a way of doing things. But um, it's, it's been exciting. Yeah. Really, it has. It's been challenging for a lot of people. And I know a lot of people watching this are, are facing struggles and, and we're praying for you. Uh, we want to hear from you. And-